As promised, Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated joins us now. He joins us not from his typical spot in Louisville, but instead from one of the epicenters of college football. And who would have thought that six games in, you are in East Lansing, Michigan. Pat, uh, I assume you are there to kind of uncover the secrets to the Spartan success to this point? That's it. I'm here for one of the best stories in college football right now, Dave. Uh, I mean, really remarkable what Michigan State has done Nobody expected this to be the case. Uh, really, this the the revamping that that Mel Tucker has done very quickly of this program. Uh, you know, I think that they had gotten a little bit uh, almost obsolete in the latter years under Mark D'Antonio. Had a transition year, really a, a mulligan year, I think, uh, last year. And I heard you saying it. Yes, Mel Tucker won't make the excuses, but we can make them for him because they're legitimate. And now you look at this team. I mean. They're explosive. They're entertaining. They are fun to talk to, fun to watch. Uh, it is, it's a great story brewing here in East Lansing. I don't want to spoil the story at this point because I, you know, I want you to get your clicks and all that. But <laughs> big picture, w- what's your takeaway as to kind of how this happened? What have you learned in your time there? Well, you know, I think Mel Tucker's succeeded hugely in two different things. First, I mean, he's won the locker room and he's convinced guys that, that he's, he's the guy to get them better. And, and they have bought into his coaching. Uh, and then secondly, they went out and won the transfer portal. Quite frankly, you know, they did great work there. And certainly you start with Kenneth Walker, the third, who r- right now probably would be my Heisman front runner. And you combine the guys that, that he inherited and they have developed and injected confidence into, and then you add the newcomers that they brought in, and it's been quite a, a magical formula. Speaking of magical, you were in Iowa City this past weekend. That was the first time you were ever there for a game. Just interested in, in your takeaways from what you saw, specifically focusing on the Hawkeyes. Yeah, one of the great atmospheres I've seen. I mean, it's just phenomenal. You know, everybody knew it was a big game and they were super excited for it. And, and Iowa City showed out uh, the town, the students, the the fans, everything was phenomenal. The atmosphere uh, and they won in such classic Kirk, Fer- Kirk Ferentz style, you know, that it was it was just a perfect Iowa day. I thought, you know, the only thing that wasn't maybe typical was just the fact that it was really warm. Uh, but, you know, if, if it had been 38 degrees and cloudy, it would have been perfect. But it, anyway, you know, I mean, it was field position. It, the punting game was flawless. The defense, the takeaways that you guys talked about and the uh, secondary. And we did talk to some of the players and, you know, they, they do work hard on things like keeping eyes on the quarterback all the time so that they, they can read him and know where the ball is going. And that helps your interception rate. Uh, but then honor the running game and you set up that big pass by running uh, Tyler Goodson 25 times during that game. So it was just it was all the elements that make Kirk Ferentz a great coach coming together on a perfect Saturday in a big game. They got a little bit lucky for sure with the injury to Sean Clifford, but that's part of the game. And they took advantage in a big, big way. You know, it's interesting because people say, well, how do you how can you be one of the best teams in the country if you're last in your own league in total offense? I was talking with Howard and Nicole, though, yesterday, their average starting field position was 19 yards better than Penn State's on average yeah. for the game. I mean, so yeah, if that, you're getting 19 yards, a uh, 19 yard advantage every time you have an exchange of the ball, that goes a long way, Pat. Huge, absolutely huge. You know, I mean, you don't have to drive 80 yards if you're, you know, you're driving, if you're driving 50, it's a lot easier. And the other thing, the other part of that is if you are continually pinning the other team down, especially in the, the one end of the stadium there where it's enclosed, it is incredibly loud. And we saw the effect that it had on the Nittany Lions. False start, false start, false start. And you're doing that, especially to an inexperienced backup quarterback. That turned out to just be a, a, an un overcomable, which is not even a word, but a, an insurmountable task for, for Penn State. And so that's where the field position just played such a huge part in it. Okay, so I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth now and ask you, do you worry about them if somehow somebody puts a, a big number on them, if someone figures it out and is able to stop turning the ball over and they get into, I don't want to say a shootout, like I don't think they're going to get into a shootout, but let's say magically somebody scores more than 24 points against (laughs) them, right? Do you believe that they are good enough on offense to keep up with that? 
No, I don't, uh, frankly. I mean, look, again, they, <laughs> well, they have done, they've done did, phenomenal you work. You didn't even hem and haw on that. Okay. Yeah, there's no hemming or hawing here. <laughs> they, look, they, they have done a phenomenal job maximizing what they have, but that offense is limited. And I do think that eventually, and I mean, it may be a long time. It may be Nebraska in the last game of the regular season. It may be if you play an Ohio, an explosive Ohio State team or an explosive Michigan State team in a Big Ten championship that all of a sudden then – you're having to match points because you're just not going to hold those teams down. And that's where, you know, Spencer Petras has played really well and they have absolute faith in him, which has helped him and helped them. Uh, but, you know, is he going to throw it for 300 yards and three touchdowns, four touchdowns if need be? I think that's a big ask. So I think eventually, and I, again, it may be the college football playoff before you run up against a team that can do it to you. But there probably is that team out there. So who's the Big Ten's best team then, in your opinion, at this point? Well, on paper, it's Iowa. They've done the most. You know, I mean, the they win over Penn State, very impressive. Uh, big wins over Iowa State, over Maryland, over Indiana. You know, they have done everything you can do to this point. So I put them at the top. Uh, and then I guess I would say Michigan slightly over Michigan State in terms of resume to this point. Uh, but that's real close between those two. Uh, I give them credit for winning at Nebraska, whereas uh, the Nebraska-Michigan State game was in East Lansing here. But those two are, are very close, two and three in the Big Ten at this point. And then you've got uh, Ohio State looming there, I think, you know, just waiting to – it looks like they're hitting their stride and they're waiting for the chance to play some of these big, big, big opponents. I always love to get your national perspective when we vote – or when we talk to you, I should say, each week. And uh, it's tough to ignore Alabama losing this week, tough to ignore – Red River, what were your biggest takeaways absent of the Big Ten? Yeah, I mean, obviously, an Alabama loss is, is huge, huge news, and especially in a spot that nobody thought was going to happen, given how Texas A&M had looked uh, earlier in the season. And I, I think it's a big warning sign for Alabama. They played two games on the road and barely won one, lost the other. Neither In neither game did their defense play well at all. And on paper, that was going to be the best part of that team coming into the season. So Nick Saban has some work to do defensively there. Uh, and the SEC West is still going to give them some tough opponents. And then if they're lucky enough to get to an SEC championship game, right now Georgia looks much better than they do. So that jumped out. The Red River game every year is bonkers. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it is a shootout that goes crazy with weird things happening. And it, it, it goes down to the wire. Uh, I think this is eight of the last nine that have been a single score game. So that was a lot of fun to see. And I put Oklahoma in a category where I can't believe they're still winning, but they are. They're they're undefeated, even though they have really not played very well yet this year. Uh, that is for sure. It is a rivalry game that always delivers. We're going to talk a little bit about some rivalries with you coming up a little bit later in the show. So hang tight. Pat Forty in East Lansing. The Rutgers Scarlet Knights are the only undefeated team in conference play in Big Ten women's soccer, sporting a perfect Six and oh, Mark, heading into their next match Thursday against Maryland. Rutgers ranked eighth in the nation in the latest coaches poll. That is the highest of any Big Ten team. They are led by the only three time All American in school history, forward Amira Ali, who joins us now. She is today's big interview. Amira, let's start with this. This team started off really great, and then you hit a rough patch. You lost to Princeton and Georgetown. Since then, you've rolled off seven straight wins. What has clicked here with Rutgers soccer during that winning streak? Um, I think it's just our how we compete together, um, how we work together on the field, just our bond on and off the field. I think that really just translates to our success on the field. Um, we had goals for ourselves, and I think that we did fall down a little bit with um, Princeton and Georgetown, but we knew what we had to do to get back on that track to get back to where we wanted and for our goals, to, to reach our goals. Now, because you played in the spring last year due to COVID, this is basically your second season in a span of four or five months. How challenging was that to kind of ramp up right away without the normal time that you would have in between? Yes, it was definitely a little rough. I know a couple of us had injuries at the end of that last spring season, and it was a little less time to get ready for this one to prepare. But um, we just focused on getting healthy and getting back on the field, and I feel like it was just the perfect amount of time. We're still still in shape from our last season. We're still keeping the ball rolling from our last season. And I think that, you know, even if it was a shorter turnaround, I feel like we were still prepared for this season coming up, this season that we're in right now. Now, this is your fifth season playing. So, obviously, you opted to use that COVID year 
and come back. Rutgers has been to nine straight NCAA tournaments, so this is a, a powerhouse program, as most people who follow Big Ten soccer are well aware. But during your time, you haven't really made a deep NCAA tournament run. How big an incentive was that for you and a motivating factor in terms of when you weighed whether or not to come back? Oh, it was a huge part of my decision, and um, I feel like we definitely have the talent this year, and I can really see that happening this year, going far. And um, I didn't want to leave here until we did that, so I definitely had a lot to do with my decision. How do you feel like it's coming together with this team? Is this a group you can see making that progress? This is definitely a team I can see making it um, to, and re reaching that goal that we have. Um, we're very dedicated on and off the field. Um, we play for each other. We play for something bigger than ourselves and with that Rutgers pride. So I can definitely see this team being that. Amira, interesting to me, I mentioned all your accolades, and you have really been the headliner for this team through the years. Now Frankie Tagliaferri transferred in from Penn State, and so you have shared some of those headlines with her. What has that been like for you? Um, honestly, it's so amazing. Just I've grown up with her, played against her in so many different stages in my life, and just being able to finally play with her was just honestly the best thing that could have happened for our team and I'm just happy she made the decision to come here um, because see, she's such an amazing player and she makes us better on the field so definitely such a huge thing and I really appreciate like love that she's here with us. What role did you play in convincing her that Rutgers was the right place for her? Um, I actually haven't talked to her about it. I found out through our coaches that she was coming, and I just feel like after that, though, I was texting her and, you know, excited to play with her, and I'm just glad that she's here. I mentioned you are the first ever three-time All-American in Rutgers history, which is amazing in and of itself. I think it's even more amazing when you consider Carly Lloyd played at Rutgers. So, I mean, it's not <laughs> like Rutgers hasn't had good players. Yeah, Carly Lloyd is one of the most instrumental players in the history of the U.S., women's national team. What does it mean to you to have that distinction, despite the fact that one of the all-time greats played at your school? Um, it's such an honor. I mean, Carly Lloyd has done so much for her, making a name for herself for our school, and just being up there with her is just an amazing thing. And I'm just grateful for all the people who's helped me along the way to get to where I am today. Take us through your history a little bit in soccer. I know you kind of fell in love with the sport watching your brother play when you were a little yes, kid. Yeah. At what point did you realize, hey, I'm pretty good at this too? Um, I think I've kind of always had a passion for it. Um, I know four years old, you probably don't know if you're gonna love something, but I think by the time I was like eight or nine, 10, I knew that my goal was to be playing in college soccer. And um, it's, it's been the best thing, so best thing in my life so far, even making it here. And I'm definitely excited for what's to come after as well. You grew up in New Jersey, and as we said, Rutgers is a powerhouse mm -hmm. program, so maybe that's a, an easy decision for you. But, but give me a sense of kind of what appealed to you about Rutgers and continuing that tradition. I think just being the Jersey girl that I am, too, I just wanted to stay home, be around family. I know the program is such an amazing program. They have a lot of accolades, a lot of people who have come out of this program and done well. And I know the coaches are such family-oriented people. I know they will help me get to the next level. So that's really just where I wanted to go. I felt comfortable with them taking care of me and making sure that I got to that next step. You're majoring in criminal justice. What are your aspirations with that? Um, I mean, I do want to go further in, so in my soccer career, but after that, I would like to look into um, crime scene investigation, FBI work, things like that. Um, just really sparked my interest. What got you interested in that? Um, I, would, I would say like just shows, I don't know, movies, things like that. <laughs> Surrounding that, it's just very interesting to me. Uh, I want to leave you with this. You were talking about your aspirations of playing professionally. There's so many opportunities for women that did not exist even a decade or two ago. The NWSL is one of them. You were drafted into that. There are lots of opportunities in Europe as well. How do you kind of weigh out what's the next step? Um, well, I, after being drafted back in January of this year, um, the next step for me would be going to Portland to play for the Portland Thorns. And um, I'm just so excited to even have the opportunity to play in a league with the best players in the world. Um, and even reconnecting with Madison Pogar, she was also, I played with here. So I'm just very excited to be on that level and continue to get better. Um, 
And yeah, I'm excited for that. Well, as well you should be. Congratulations on all your success to this point. We look forward to seeing the rest of your journey at Rutgers and where it all leads for the Scarlet Knights on the soccer field this year. And then, of course, look forward to seeing what awaits you in that professional capacity as well. Amira Ali, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Pat, we discussed Iowa a little bit earlier. I want to focus now on Penn State. And what does this loss mean for the Nittany Lions, particularly in light of Clifford's injury? You know, it's not a terribly damaging loss if Sean Clifford comes back and plays well. But in terms of, like, playoff consideration, you go on the road, you play a top-five opponent, uh, you lose by three points, and your starting quarterback goes out in the first half of that game. So, you know, the, those are a lot of mitigating factors. Um, they need, obviously, some big wins, and they, they've got the schedule in front of them to do that because you, you do have Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State uh, still in front of you. But – uh, the big thing for them is, you know, judging from what we saw from Taquan Roberson, they, you know, he may end up being a good quarterback, but he was not ready to be a good quarterback on Saturday in Kinnick Stadium. So if Clifford cannot play is out for an extended period of time, they they are in a world of hurt there. So we'll have to wait and see what his status is going to be. No doubt. It does feel like it comes down to Clifford and the schedule helps them out a little bit here. They have a bye week and they have Illinois. So maybe have a little time to to figure things out. But as you said, now they kind of fall in that category of one loss playoff contenders and they have some good company. I mean, Alabama is in that category as well, among others, Ohio State, Oregon. So where do they fall in that pecking order? How do you kind of see those one loss playoff contenders right now? Yeah, I, th I think for now I'd put them kind of at the top of the one loss uh, category. You know, as I said, the, the loss is not a bad loss. Uh, and so if you back that up with eventual victories, you know, it, it will be, quote unquote, forgiven, I think, eventually. Um, you know, behind after them, it's Alabama, Ohio State, Oregon. I would still put Oregon ahead of Ohio State because they beat them in Columbus and there was nothing fluky about that win. They were the better team that day. And if they as long as they those two teams have the same record, I would lean heavily on head-to-head -head there as a determining factor. Alabama's a tough one for me to figure where to put them uh, exactly. You know, the, the opening win over Miami really doesn't mean much. Miami is very bad. Um, they, they have looked very impressive other than the loss, obviously. But is, is what is on their resume definitely better than what uh, Penn State, Oregon, and Ohio State have put on there? Eh, I'm not sure. So, I. You know, they, they could be anywhere from second to fourth, I would say, out of those those one loss teams. Every week you do uh, the 40 yard dash. And as part of that, you do your four for the playoff. It was interesting this week. Uh, Georgia and Cincinnati are in there. Iowa's in there. And then I think the fourth is the one maybe that's up for debate right now. You had Michigan. Tell me why. I, yeah, I do. Uh, and it is up for debate. I think the fourth spot is wide open at this point. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, we're going to get games that are going to help us sort this out. Uh, I, I think they've been super impressive so far. They they keep checking the boxes is the way I've put it. You know, they they won their first four games and so they were all at home. OK, what do you do when you go on the road? Well, you go to Rutgers and you win that game. Then you go take on a very hot Nebraska team and Nebraska gives you everything they have in terms of atmosphere and readiness and explosiveness. You fall behind for the first time all season. You come back and you get the win. So that puts them just a little bit ahead of Michigan State in my book. And then I think after that is where you start getting to the one loss teams uh, who would follow uh, them. I, you know, I'm not sure there's anybody else who's undefeated right now. See, again, I, I'm, a, I'm an Oklahoma doubter. I remain an Oklahoma doubter. It was a good win, obviously, coming from three touchdowns behind to beat Texas. But I still just haven't seen them look really impressive and dominate an opponent yet this year. So uh, now if they keep winning, uh, you're going to have to play a pretty good Baylor team, uh, an undefeated right now Oklahoma State team. So they're going to have some chances to enhance the resume as they go along. It does feel like a little bit of an unsteady foundation based on what we've seen to this point. No doubt some, some narrow escapes for the Sooners. Uh, other items in the dash I found interesting this week. You were talking about the fact USC opened so early in the year. And it is unusual, right, that you have a high-profile coaching gig, which everyone knows is open essentially for the entire season. And you were talking about some of the candidates, maybe to a certain extent, falling by the wayside. I think what interested me was how much do you think candidates for a job like that are considered on the breadth of their resume versus how much do you think they're considered on in the moment? What's going on right now? Well, yeah, that's a delicate balance, I think, Dave, obviously, for the for the people doing the hiring have to look at the big picture. 
but you also you know need to be able to sell your new guy, especially if it's not a slam dunk hire. Uh, if you're trying to sell Matt Campbell, career Midwestern guy, and he's coming off a season where they started in the top 10 and then they fall out of the rankings uh, and they've lost the, to the only good teams they've played so far, that becomes a little bit more of a difficult sell. Uh, there's just a lot of, of things that go into a hire that if, 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 the, if the populace isn't immediately like really excited about, you, you sure want them coming in on a high note. And I think, you know, the, that you look at a lot of the candidates for USC and there's there's some been some wobbles this season that they, I think have compromised maybe that that chance for a sizzle factor uh, w- within the hire. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how they weigh that, because uh, there is always that. Do you win the press conference? But I think USC you need to start winning some games, right? <laughs> more more <laughs> yeah. so than, than winning the press conference. Finally, we kind of hinted at it earlier, but you'd gone through and ranked some of these rivalry games and, and kind of the extent to which they deliver. It is hard to argue with Red River, and this was kind of another case in point. I mean, what an unbelievable game that was yeah. on Saturday at the State Fair at the Cotton Bowl. What else here? Uh, well, you know, I think, that, yeah, the Red River stands out in terms of closeness, competitiveness. Army-Navy has been phenomenal. Uh, the average margin of victory is 9.9 points in the last decade. I took the last 10 matchups in all these rivalries, which is super close. The only one that's uh, lower is Red River, although Oak and Bucket, I just went and actually did the numbers on that. Indiana-Penn State, I'm sorry, Indiana-Purdue, uh, 9.6 points there. Uh, but Army-Navy has delivered time and again. Uh, if you look at, at uh, Michigan-Ohio State, that's been a hammer and nail rivalry where uh, Ohio State has been the hammer, Michigan has been the nail lately. They, Ohio State's won 9 out of 10, average margin 15 points there. Iron Bowl has not been very close. Alabama and Auburn, that's a 20-point margin, and that's what Nick Saban does to rivalries. He kills them, basically. He did the same with Alabama-Tennessee. Uh, if you look at uh, within the Big Ten, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Paul Bunyan axe game, hammer and nail. That's Wisconsin winning nine out of ten there. Uh, Floyd of Rosedale has been pretty good. I was certainly one more uh, than Minnesota, eight out of the last ten, but the games have been relatively close. Michigan, Michigan State, pretty close games. Michigan State's won six of the last ten. Michigan's won four. So that's that's some of your rivalries just in terms of how competitive are they how exciting are they to watch well, there have been some compelling moments in michigan michigan state and you say oh, auburn yeah. alabama hammer and nail but uh man the, the the time that the nail got its revenge was really something wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> i was there for that kick six game and i will never that was pretty good that. yeah that was pretty good pat 40 we'll talk to you next week enjoy the rest of your stay in east lansing my friend thanks dave we mentioned midseason time to hand out some awards. Are these the Wannies? Do we want to brand these the Wannies? Well, is, it, is it premature for that? It's, let's see how okay. they end up at the end of the year. Maybe we'll come back to this segment, okay, and replay this if it works. Your <laughs> midseason team of the year? Uh, Ohio State. I mean, really? Yeah, you know, just because I I really believe, and in, in we'll it's for another discussion, that they've got that defense squared away. It's night and day, yards, sacks, turnovers, everything. And offensively right now, you're leading the country in, in yards and yeah. point, in the top 10 in points. So Ohio State. Wow. Wow. Yep. They've lost a game. I mean, Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State said they're undefeated. Yeah, they, They'll was, have something to say. Wasn't the offense. When defense, uh, I think he's catching up. Best defensive player in the Big Ten to this point? Uh, Aiden Hutchinson. I'm going to go. And you know what? This was a tough one for me. I mean, because every team from Michigan State to Maryland to Iowa's got four or five. But, but I like, you know, Michigan's defense is playing better. They're not blitzing where there's six guys coming. So a defensive lineman now, when you're rushing four a lot more, which they're doing, now you're going to have to legitimately beat some blocks. And this guy's just, just not leading the Big Ten in sacks. I mean, he is he's a high-energy, productive player, and he's the leader of that defense. Uh, he's fabulous yeah. all over the field. What about best offensive player? Got to go with Kenneth Walker to third. You know, I mean, he's obviously at one of the favorites, front runners for the Heisman. Uh, at the top of the list for yards in the country, not just in the Big Ten, uh, and he, for a number of carries. So this guy's not ripping off last week. What do you have? Almost 30 carries last week. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? So he's he's getting the football a lot. And to me, that separates the guys that are, you know, get 10 carries and hit the home run, guys. He's he's a every dime back. Well, he certainly hit the, the one home run last week. But even if he hadn't hit the home run, he still would have had 120 rushing yards. Exactly. Right? That's a, exactly. Yeah, he's just he is phenomenal. Best coaching job to this point. I'm going to go. I'm going to stay with uh, the big green, Michigan State. I'm going to go with Mel Tucker. You know, and, and I look at this team, you know, preseason polls, I was I was looking at it, and there was a lot of these national polls that had Michigan State as one of the worst teams in the entire country. I mean, like bottom 10 had no respect for Michigan State, no respect for their coaches or players. And when you look at he's, what he's done and his staff has done developing, you know, Peyton Thorne, the quarterback, besides Walker, and you look at the defense making plays and winning games on special teams, that's coaching football. Yeah, has done an absolutely amazing job. I don't think, I mean, I don't know if I would have picked them last and I'll make predictions, but I certainly wouldn't have picked them to be anywhere near where they are, and I, I think very few people would have. It, it has been remarkable. Can't wait to follow it. In the second half, we'll hand yeah, out well, the awards I'm, at the I'm, end of the year, I'm keeping too. this. I'm keeping this. I want to see if this is true. <laughs>